gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's, uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Zhuanhe Zhao, and he'll be uh, just telling us about some of his research on uh, soft materials in uh, global and solving hard problems in global health. Um, it's been unusual because uh, he's, he is a professor of mechanical engineering, civil and environmental engineering. Uh, but a lot of his research has to do more with um, health issues that you might expect from the uh, biological engineering or course seven. Um, so he has been, uh, he's a very prolific inventor. Uh, he is currently the, uh, the recipient of the NSF Career Award, the ONR Young Investigator Award, SES Young Investigator Medal, ASME Hughes Young Investigator Award, uh, Materials Today's uh, Rising Star Award, Claravate highly cited researcher. Um, he is also I mentioned he is the Georgian Hatsopoulos uh, faculty fellow at MIT. Uh, the mission of the lab is to adva advance science and technology on the interface between humans and machines, addressing grand societal challenges in health and sustainability by integrating expert the expertise in materials, mechanics, and biotechnology. Um, so with that, um, I would, I will uh, hand over control of the screen uh, to Professor Zhao. Thank you uh, so much uh, for the invitation and the kind introduction, Megan. Uh, so today I'll talk about uh, soft materials innovation for global health, Xuan Hezao from MIT. Uh, so uh, conflict of interest declaration, uh, I co-founded uh, Sunlight Hill. I received royalty from CRS and I will discuss results related to both uh, companies. Uh, the research mission of my life is to merge humans and machines. Over the last century, we see great progress in terms of engineering and understanding the human body. Uh, modern medicine, biology, genetics, uh, these are the examples. Uh, similarly, in the domain of machines, we see great progress in terms of electronics, uh, computer, internet, robotics, AI. However, there's a huge gap in between, right? Uh, what if we can truly merge humans and machines, right? Uh, better health, uh, that's what we all want. Uh, however, if you think about all the way from wearable devices, medical equipment, medical implants, uh, these are machines trying to merge with the human body uh, over a few hours to days to months and even years, right? Uh, nowadays, we design more and more sophisticated machines. Uh, the interface remains the same. Metals, rigid plastics, ceramics, right? What if we can design much better interface between humans and the machines? Uh, can we monitor COVID effects on multiple organs at home, basically treat COVID at home? Uh, continuous image heart diseases with wearable devices, uh, remotely treat a uh, stroke within the golden hour. Uh, these are really the leading causes of uh, global death, right? Uh, can we achieve that? Uh, understanding the brain, right? Uh, there are 86 billion neurons in the brain. Uh, the currently we can only interface with around 3,000 neurons, right? Uh, if we can design much better uh, brain computer interface here, right? Uh, can we interface with even a million neurons in a living brain to better understand the brain and the intelligence, right? Uh, then now, if we think even further, an essential component in future AI, robotics, VR. Uh, no matter from movies or from realistic examples, uh, is human machine interface for sure. And that has the potential to uh, impact uh, future humans and society. You can see lots of motivations. There are many more. Uh, let's see what's the challenge. Uh, it turns out this is a grand challenge in materials, mechanics, biology, uh, due to the fundamental different material properties. Right? Human body are most based on soft, soft white, living components. On the other hand, uh, current machines are mostly based on hard, dry, abiotic materials, how to merge them together. Right? Uh, now, let's take a closer look at the different components of the human body, right? except the teeth, bone, and the nails, all other components of a human body actually are soft materials. Uh, their uh, rigidity is on the order of one kilopascal to 10 megapascal. Uh, they are also white, uh, containing 70 to 90 percent water, and also they are living. They can grow, sense, respond, self-heal. Also, under millions of cycles low, they can still maintain robustness and maintain this uh, well-being right, over time. Uh, then with this understanding, uh, we propose a new idea. 
uh, we call it a soft materials technology. Uh, the idea is uh, now you design soft materials, uh, hydrogels, elastomers, uh, with mechanical and the physiological properties very similar to different components of human body, right? And they use that soft material to interface uh, with the human body that can form long-term high efficacy interfaces with the human body. People already uh, prove that in the field of biology. Uh, then uh, at the same time, you can embed and integrate uh, sensors, actuators, computer chips, even robots within this soft material interface. And that will lead to long-term seamless interfacing between humans and machines, even merging of humans and machines, right? Uh, so of course, uh, to develop this soft material technology is based on a decades of fundamental study of a polymer chemistry and polymer physics. These are some of the pioneers in the field. Uh, but we also need to design this extreme properties of soft material. Right? Imagine there's a piece of uh, jello, uh, you know, containing lots of water, it's also soft. Now we also need to design this jello to be tough, to be strong, to be fatigue resistant, and the multiple cycles of loading to be adhesive to both to external machine and the human body and actually interact with different components of human body. Also electrically, optically, acoustically transparent between human body and the machines uh, to uh, communicate between humans and the machines, right? How do we design that, right? So uh, in today, today's talk, I will use a few examples uh, to illustrate this uh, fundamental properties impact on global health. Right? So number one, uh, bioadhesive to replace sutures, right? So here is the motivation. Uh, there is over 310 million major surgeries uh, per year, right? And uh, most of them require suturing uh, to close the wound. However, suturing can cause tissue damage, pain, scar, infection, leakage. And the suturing is also unsuitable for uh, modern technology, bioelectronics, wearable devices, robotic surgery, right? Uh, in, on the other hand, suturing is also an ancient technology. Over thousands of year, years, uh, human beings have been using suturing to close wound. Only at the very beginning of this century, uh, people begin to develop bioadhesives or tissue adhesives trying to replace uh, sutures, right? Uh, lots of challenges. Uh, number one, weak and brittle. Number two, it takes too long to form the adhesion with existing tissue adhesive. And also many of the tissue adhesive are toxic. They are based on monomers. And once those monomer tear into plastic, this is plastic is too rigid in comparison with human tissue. Also, the process can be complicated. Uh, you need a UV, heat, mixing, uh, spreading liquids. So uh, with these challenges, it's almost impossible to replace the highly mature suture to close wound, right? Uh, let's see how we can address these challenges one by one. Right? Now, the first one. Uh, let's go to fundamentals. Right? Uh, the reason for this weakness is because previous works were focused on the interfacial chemistry. You can see uh, people develop beautiful chemistries to bond the different molecules to tissue. That's great. Uh, however, if you look at this video, right, this is a peeling test. Uh, you peeling this bioadhesive from another material. Uh, you see the problem. The cohesive failure of this bulk adhesive uh, sets an upper limit. That's on the order of 10 joule per meter square, right? Uh, so that no matter how you design this interface, uh, these give an upper limit, right? Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, 2014 Nature paper, right, uh, compared uh, many uh, bioadhesives, and uh, it turns out uh, 20 joule per meter square uh, was the state of art at that time, right? around uh, this order of 10 joule per meter square, right? Uh, then in 2015, uh, we believe we changed the research landscape in this field, right? Uh, we developed this hydrogel adhesive with 90% water adhered on silicon, silicon dioxide, glass, ceramic, titanium, aluminum, iron, elastomers, different types of hydrogels with adhesion energy over a thousand joule per meter square. So that's orders of magnitude enhancement, right? So, and also this is a very diverse method. It's not limited to a specific material. You can apply this method to diverse bioadhesive polymers. How do we achieve that? So three principles, uh, it's quite uh, straightforward. Uh, number one, actually we understand this. 
Uh, in order to design this tough biodiesel, uh, you need to design tough hydrogen matrix first. Otherwise, this uh, cohesive failure will give you the upper limits. Uh, then in order to design this tough hydrogel, uh, you need to build the dissipation into stretch network. Uh, you need to make this material very deformable. At the same time, lots of mechanical dissipation and that will make this uh, uh, material tough. Uh, then for tough adhesion, uh, now you need to integrate this bulk dissipation together with a strong interfacial linkage. A summation of these two will give a very high uh, interfacial toughness or adhesion energy on the order of thousands of joule per square, right? So that's that. Uh, then let's see how we can address the second challenge, right? Uh, this uh, slope, right? Uh, the first one is energetic. The second one is about the kinetics, about the speed of this process, right? Uh, let's go to first principle two, right? Uh, all tissues inside the human body are covered by a layer of water, right? These are white tissues and organs, right? Now, a uh, conventional bioadhesive, in order to form this adhesion, they need to diffuse these adhesive molecules across this water layer to form the adhesion, right? Uh, that's good. Uh, then let's see what, what's the problem. For a single monomer, a small molecule, the time scale is the uh, you know, length scale of this water layer thickness divided by diffusivity, that's good. However, for long chain polymers, now you need to multiply this monomer time by N. N is degree of polymerization. That's on the order of thousands, even to millions. Uh, then really, you need a five to 30 minutes to form stable adhesion on white tissues. And uh, you know, surgeons told us they only have less than a few seconds to adhere things together, right? How to address this challenge? Uh, it turns out uh, spider web already solved this challenge. You can see a uh, spider web, no matter in dry environment or in wide environment, they can adhere different types of insects. How do they do that? Uh, so here is the solution, right? Uh, you design a dry polymer network. So this is a polymer network already crosslink, very different from the uh, adhesive molecules, right? This is already crosslink dry polymer network. Uh, then this dry polymer network will absorb interfacial water like the spider web did, right? You absorb interfacial water because water are small molecules. Then the diffusion time is very fast. Within five seconds, you absorb this interfacial water and this uh, crosslink network swell into a tough hydrogel. And then this hydrogel form very fast, uh, you know, instant uh, uh, reversible bond, such as a, a hydrogen bond and the strong covalent bond, such as a mean bond with the tissue. Uh, then you satisfy all the criteria for forming this uh, fast and the tough adhesion between tissues and the adhesive. Not only that, we also have a byproduct that benefit. So here you can see, now we have a double set tape uh, form factor of this uh, tissue adhesive, right? Traditional tissue and tissue are based on you know, liquid glue form factor. However, in our daily life, we know it's easy to use double set tape to adhere things together. Now with this uh, dry cross link polymer network, indeed, we have this double side tape. And once this double side tape swell up into a hydrogel, this hydrogel is very soft, matching the rigidity of soft tissue. So you address all the challenges of existing bioadhesive. Let's see the performance, right? Uh, so here, really, you can uh, adhere diverse white tissues uh, and the devices within five seconds, right? Uh, this is a sashimi plate, uh, skin, tendon, stomach, muscle, heart, liver, five seconds, adhere them together. And this is two device materials, hydrogel, silicone, uh, titanium, PDMS, polyimac, polycarbonate, right? Within five seconds, you can form this very tough adhesion uh, between white tissues and the devices. Uh, and we also compare with the performance of a commercially available bioadhesives on the market, right? So we measure this number in terms of adhesion energy and the shear and the tensile strength, right? How strong you can adhere tissues together. Also, there are papers already report these numbers, right? Uh, so it turns out the performance of this tissue double side tape are multiple times higher than existing bioadhesives on the market, right? Not only that, 
This is even more important. So if you read the menu of this bioadhesive, indeed, it requires over one minute to form an adhesion. It's in their menu. Uh, for us, uh, around five seconds, you can form this very strong and long-term uh, stable adhesion within five seconds, right? Uh, so that's that. I will show some animal studies. There will be some blood. Uh, if you're allergic to blood, you can uh, you know, turn off your screen just for a few seconds, right? So let's see some uh, you know, animal studies, right? Uh, so based on this technology, uh, we propose bioadhesive drug delivery or even bioelectronics. Uh, literally, we can adhere a drug patch or an electrode to a beating heart or other organs in the body within five seconds. You can see here, you can adhere this drug patch or an electrode uh, to this beating heart uh, within five seconds without any suture. Uh, you can see after this five second, gradually you deliver drug uh, to this organ. Uh, not only that, because we don't require suture, then minimal invasive delivery become uh, easier. So actually, indeed, now we develop capabilities to minimal invasively deliver drug patches, electrode to different uh, wide dynamic organs of the body. So that's the uh, potential impact. Uh, then another one is uh, this, this is a hemorrhage, so severe bleeding condition. So basically we poke a hole on the beating heart of anticoagulated red or pig models, right? Uh, so this is a really severe condition you can see here. Uh, after you poke this hole, uh, this, uh, this blood pressure dropped by over 50%. Uh, if this lasts a few seconds, uh, this animal will die. But uh, with this uh, bioadhesive technology, within five seconds, we seal the wound, literally you, uh, you know, adhere it together without the formation of coagulation. You don't need a for, uh, formation of coagulation uh, to seal this wound, and then the animal actually eventually recover, uh, survive over the long term, right? So uh, not only for this uh, uh, hemostasis, uh, you can also use this uh, to seal wound along the GI tract. For example, after removing a tumor, uh, you know, the uh, stomach, uh, intestine, uh, may form leakage. Uh, so if you suture them up, but uh, now with our bioadhesive type, without any suture, literally you can seal this wound and then the wound heal over the long term. So we, you have results on that. So basically now you can uh, develop this technology uh, of bioadhesive sealing uh, suture this without any suture. Uh, then this is the most uh, recent results bioadhesive ultrasound, right? So this is the way we do ultrasound imaging uh, nowadays, right? Uh, you go to hospital, a clinician use a thick handhold ultrasound probe uh, through this uh, liquid coupling layer, liquid gel layer, uh, to take an uh, ultrasound image inside the body. It's a short term, it's only a few seconds, right? So that's the current paradigm. It's already quite powerful. Uh, now let me introduce a fundamentally different paradigm. Uh, now we design this very thin ultrasound probe. So this is like a small patch. And with our bioadhesive, uh, we adhere this patch to the skin, to different locations of the body. You can see, uh, this is how you design and fabricate this uh, uh, thin uh, uh, ultrasound probe. Right? You can even use a 3D printing. Uh, this is a very high resolution and the power is very low because it's because of this uh, thin form factor. For Apple Watch, it's on the order of 100 milliwatts. For this bioadhesive ultrasound, only 10 milliwatts. So really, now you can make ultrasound imaging into a wearable device, give you long-term imaging of internal organs of the body. Uh, let's see the impact. Uh, so now in comparison with existing ultrasound, the existing wearable ultrasound, you can see, we have much higher resolution and a much longer uh, you know, continuous imaging duration because uh, this bioadhesive design and the ultrasound probe design, right? So if you compare with the state of art. Uh, not only that, let's see the uh, performance, right? So this is the first time real-time monitoring of COVID lung symptoms at home, right? fight COVID at home, right? Uh, so basically uh, we adhere uh, a bioadhesive ultrasound on the uh, you know, chest of a COVID patient uh, and the COVID patient stay at home for every 15 to 30 minutes, uh, the ultrasound take an image. Uh, and then why this is important, you can see, uh, this is uh, without the symptom. If this patient is asymptomatic or if the symptom not sets in yet, uh, you see this uh, thin and the smooth pro line, uh, very clear A lines, right? 
However, if the COVID symptoms sets in, uh, the pro line become irregular, A line condensed, uh, then this means uh, this patient is uh, uh, symptom sets in, right? Uh, if this symptom gets severe, uh, then the hospital will give this patient a call, a warning. At this time, this patient uh, need to go to hospital for treatment. So that's our vision, how we can fight this COVID pandemic really at home, right? Uh, so uh, real-time monitoring COVID uh, uh, symptom at home. Uh, this is another one, uh, long-term continuous monitoring of blood pressure waveform. Right? Uh, there are over 1 billion adults uh, globally have hypertension, including myself. Uh, hypertension is the most important preventable risk factor for premature death. Right? It's highly desirable to continuously measure your blood pressure level right? uh, over the long-term days, even weeks. Right? But we know how cumbersome the cough monitor nowadays is, right? Uh, so it turns out the blood pressure is correlated uh, with the diameter of this carotid artery, right? Uh, then with bioadhesive ultrasound, we can literally image this carotid artery over time. And then we can use AI algorithm to calculate the diameter. Then we calculate the blood pressure and then we measure that over the long term, uh, 48 hours, two days, for example. Uh, so here's the potential impact. Uh, for example, I'm giving this talk and the, uh, you know, the patch uh, measures that my blood pressure are getting high because I'm too excited talking with alumni. Uh, then it will send me a warning. So I should calm down or I should take a pill before giving this talk. So this is the kind of potential impact uh, this technology may make. Right? Uh, then another one, uh, heart, right? Uh, the first time long-term real-time imaging of cardiac dynamics over two days, right? Uh, so what's the potential impact? Cardiovascular disease is a uh, number one cause of uh, global death, but it turns out 78% of heart attacks are undiagnosed by ECG, right? So we know Apple Watch currently has ECG, but ECG cannot detect the majority of the heart attack. We really need this kind of medical imaging uh, to tell you the symptom, uh, to tell you what's going on in terms of this cardiovascular disease, right? And also, especially after COVID, heart disease risk soars 63%, even with a mild case. So we believe this technology will have a huge impact uh, in terms of cardiovascular disease, especially after, uh, at this uh, post-COVID society. Right? Uh, now, sports medicine, uh, we can measure the uh, muscle of uh, your body uh, over the long term. Right? Uh, then you do answer the question, how much exercise is sufficient or too much? Uh, you know, uh, by feeling, you don't know, but uh, by ultrasound, it can tell you now it's sufficient. You do not want to overdo it, right? Uh, impact on sports medicine, rehabilitation, right? Uh, so this is on GI, right? So the stomach, uh, you know, uh, uh, intestine, uh, basically you may feel, you know, a uh, stomachache, a uh, heartburn. You don't know what's going on, but now with this ultrasound, Potentially, you can see some, uh, you know, symptoms. Right? So, for example, this is after I drink a cup of coffee. Uh, you can see this extended uh, stomach. Uh, this is after I empty the stomach. Uh, this is the shape of the stomach. Right? This kind of potential impact. Many other possibilities. Right? Uh, so here is our vision. Uh, the state of art variables. Right? Uh, Apple Watch give you ECG linear data. Uh, we believe future variables will give you multimodal continuous data from diverse organs, especially imaging, right? Blood vessel, muscle, lung, therapy, GI, heart, many other organs of the body, right? So that's our, uh, you know, uh, vision. Uh, there is such huge amount of data, right? Uh, you cannot hope a clinician uh, to read those images for you. What do you do? Uh, AI, actually AI is right timing. Uh, to use AI to analyze this medical data, especially ultrasound imaging data, right? Uh, so you will transmit those data to your cell phone and the cell phone transmit them to a data center uh, and the AI will analyze this for you. Uh, then you can achieve long-term high resolution imaging of heart health and the diseases of diverse organ systems, at home monitoring of COVID and the long COVID patient, Tumor development, so to observe whether the tumor is benign or malignant, right? Phyto development, preterm birth, women's health. So let's develop technology for diversity. Not only talking about it, let's develop technology for diversity. 
brain development. Uh, so eventually, this is my dream. I want to make ultrasound a variable commodity for global health. Ultrasound is extremely uh, you know, powerful. There is no reason you have to go to a hospital to take ultrasound of your body. And uh, you know, these are really rare events. Right? Uh, I believe uh, if we work together, we can really make this a variable commodity, something similar or even cheaper than your Apple Watch. You just adhere this to the body. Uh, they need to give much better health information for your body, analyzed by AI, right? Uh, so let me conclude this part by proposing a fundamental challenge in science, technology, maybe even society. Right? Uh, currently, we can achieve super resolution imaging of a single cell, right? lots of advance and lots of uh, you know, impacts. Right? However, human body is not a single cell. Right? Uh, can we achieve long-term continuous imaging of the whole body, full body, over days to months, right? diverse organs, right? how they correlate with each other, how do they uh, interact with each other. Right? Uh, now with this bioadhesive ultrasound, uh, we are exploring this problem. Uh, we begin to obtain some data. It's extremely interesting you know, to see the correlation, for example, between blood vessel and the heart, right? uh, how do they correlate, talk with each other uh, between the GI, and the muscle and the lung, you know, how do they work as a system? We begin to understand human body as a full system over days and months. So that's that. Uh, then let me uh, switch to the second platform, uh, soft robots. Uh, so the goal is to remotely empower doctors. Uh, let me tell you the uh, motivation. Uh, stroke is globally number one cause of long-term disability, uh, number two cause of death. Uh, so there are over 15 million cases per year. Basically, one in four persons in the audience will have a stroke uh, in our lifetime, including me, right? Uh, however, stroke is, can also be reversible if you treat it at a golden hour, right? Uh, however, if you miss this golden hour, time loss equal to brain loss, right? Uh, then how to treat it? Uh, it's called a thrombectomy. Uh, basically, the neurosurgeon make an incision at the groin femoral artery of your leg, and they insert this long guide wire all the way from the leg to the brain. Right? You may ask, so there's lots of branches, right? How do I navigate? Uh, it turns out the tip of this guide wire is a J shape. Uh, then the neurosurgeon rotate outside the body, and the, this tip uh, rotate inside body for navigation, right? You can see this is really art. It takes a long time to train those neurosurgeons, four to seven years. And uh, these neurosurgeons usually work in major medical centers, right? Uh, then they are not available, especially in rural areas, right? For example, in Maine, New Hampshire, uh, maybe we do not have this neurosurgeon to do this treatment. Uh, then these heroic doctors, they also suffer from accumulated radiation, right? Because they need this fluoroscopy, X-ray imaging to see the blood vessel, to see this guide wire, right? For the navigation. Uh, for the patient, it's one time. For the neurosurgeon, it's their whole career. How do we address these intrinsic challenges, right? Uh, we propose highly operated, even autonomous robots. Uh, the idea is, now you build this uh, small guide wire robot. So this is similar to the guide wire. The thickness is on the order of your hair thickness, right? So the thickness of a hair. Uh, but uh, we build this with a soft material elastomer, and then we disperse this, uh, uh, you know, small magnets, hard magnetic particles inside this uh, straight guide wire. Then we will apply external magnetic field. This guide wire will bend, and this bending, on demand bending will give you the navigation, right? Uh, so of course, uh, you know, in order to achieve, to fabricate and design this uh, robot, uh, we need a lot of capabilities. Uh, number one, uh, we need to be able to 3D print uh, this uh, robot, right? So we develop a 3D printing capability to print this uh, robot. The thickness is really on the order of uh, the thickness of a hair, right? Uh, then the second capability, model. Uh, I will not discuss details of the model, but you can see uh, we can accurately predict how this model will deform under magnetic field. That's extremely important for both design and the later control of the robot. Uh, then capability number three uh, is in terms of design, right? We design the most agile magnetic software robot. So uh, the most agile means the tip of this robot 
can reach the largest workspace, right? Uh, our collaborator, Dr. Aman Patel at MGH, right? Uh, really appreciate uh, if you can uh, reach this uh, large work area so that you have this uh, flexibility of navigation. Uh, then we can convert this into a scientific problem uh, to do the design, right? Uh, we use uh, machine learning, we use a genetic algorithm uh, to design this uh, profile of this guide work. You can see this is quite a counterintuitive, uh, you know, this uh, counterintuitive patterns. You really need a model, uh, need a machine learning algorithm to design this kind of, uh, you know, complicated uh, pattern. But uh, we designed that. Then let's see uh, what we can do, right? So here is a real size silicon cerebrovascular model uh, with simulated blood, right? So this is uh, actually a, a patient's uh, blood vessel, uh, 3D printed with this uh, silicone model. Right? You can see there's a beautiful navigation on the amount of bending of this guide wire in order to navigate, right? So beautiful uh, navigation. And then just to put, put in perspective, uh, these are the three locations of these uh, three uh, you know, aneurysm, right? Great, right? Uh, with this, we are encouraged that we build up a full system. So here is the full robotic system. Uh, we have a C-arm fluoroscopy for imaging, a robotic arm holding a magnet to apply the external magnetic field. Uh, then you actually use a joystick, this is like playing a game. So use this joystick to control the position of the magnet, right? Uh, then you use buttons on this joystick to control the advancing uh, rejection of your guide wire and the microcatheters, right? So that's the whole process, right? Uh, beautifully, uh, the neurosurgeon can operate in another room, even another city with this joystick system to control the robot, right? Uh, then let's see some, uh, you know, uh, clinical indication. Uh, this is uh, for hemorrhagic stroke, basic aneurysm, uh, right, so once uh, there's aneurysm in the brain, uh, you want to coil it up. So this is aneurysm coiling, and this uh, metallic coil, platinum coil, will protect the aneurysm from burst, right? Uh, so here you can see full robotic uh, control of this aneurysm coiling. So first, you navigate this guide wire to this uh, target aneurysm. Uh, then after that, uh, you actually deploy here. Uh, you deploy your microcatheter. Uh, which is uh, a conduit uh, for the delivery of the, you know, coiling platinum wires. So now you deliver this a micro catheter, right? And also I want to emphasize here, this is a virtual environment. Currently we use this virtual environment for visualization. In future, we envision the doctors can even work in this VR environment, uh, literally, uh, you know, work in this environment to do this operation. Anyway, so now we deploy uh, this, uh, uh, platinum coil, right? Beautiful. The whole process uh, was operated uh, by this robotic system. Uh, the doctor is in another room, even in another city, right? Beautiful. Now you coil this aneurysm up. Great. Uh, so let's see another uh, indication. This is uh, for ischemic stroke, basic uh, blood clot uh, in the blood vessel, right? You need to really uh, retrieve it. So here is the you know our guide wire. Uh, you use this robotic system to navigate uh, this guide wire to this uh, cloth, right? So to this cloth, and then uh, the guide wire uh, needed to pierce uh, through, right? Uh, this uh, cloth, right? So that's the way you you know retrieve this cloth. Uh, you need to pierce through this cloth, and then you deliver this uh, micro catheter, right? So you deliver this a uh, micro catheter. Uh, so you can see, uh, now you uh, deliver this uh, uh, guide wire to here. And then you deliver this uh, micro catheter robotically. And then after that, you withdraw this guide wire. So you withdraw this uh, guide wire. And then you deliver a uh, stamp retriever, which is like a fish net here uh, to capture the clock and then uh, retrieve it uh, from the body. You can see, you withdraw everything together with this uh, clock. Great, yeah. Okay, uh, let's uh, take a look at the performance. 
much faster learning curve than manual operation, right? Uh, so for this neural surgeon, they, they need to be trained for over four years for manual operation, only around one hour with our robotic system. Uh, you can see, and it's not only one neural surgeon, it's all six of them all become experienced over around one hour, right? And uh, I, I want to quote Dr. Aman Patel, who is the director of uh, several vascular and one endovascular neural uh, surgery, right? Uh, with his help, they didn't need my thousands of hours of surgical expertise to approach my level of skill, uh, imagine the potential uh, impact, right? So this is another uh, treatment, right? Uh, so th uh, this is a much better performance than manual operation, right? Uh, you can see, this is the robotic operation, right? So quite smooth. You do not touch the brown ratio or touch the aneurysm. Uh, this is the passive waste guide wire, right? Uh, due to this intrinsic J shape of the uh, guide wire, unavoidably, uh, you will touch the blood vessel. And the operation is also uh, longer uh, than the robotic operation, right? Longer operation time, more undesired steering and touch, right? So this is quantitative data, right? Uh, you can see uh, this neurosurgeon uh, even trained uh, four years uh, for manual operation, only one hour with robotic system. Uh, it's already faster to operate with the robotic system to perform the same task, right? Uh, it's already faster. And this is uh, more important. Uh, so with the manual operation, right? Uh, there's some intrinsic undesired navigation steering. I just, uh, you know, told you, show you the video, right? Uh, with the robotic system, very quickly, you reduce to zero uh, because now literally you are navigating a straight guideway inside the blood vessel. There are lots of space to avoid this undesired touching, right? And the complication rate uh, for this uh, neural intervention is on the order of 10 to 20%, mainly due to long operation time and the undesired steering, right? Imagine the potential uh, you know, impact of this robotic system. And not only that, now we are even develop autonomous or semi-autonomous navigation. Uh, the key idea is still uh, based on the model, uh, based on this high quality medical imaging, uh, then this high quality imaging uh, will give you uh, basically this uh, landscape, right? Uh, the, uh, the, this is a control problem. How do I bend or deform my guide wire robot to the desired trajectory, right? Uh, then you can use the machine learning to solve this problem, right? Uh, you do lots of simulation. Then machine learning can tell you uh, what magnetic field you should apply in order to achieve this uh, desired trajectory, right? So that's the key idea. Uh, let's see some results, right? So this is a live pig model. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, uh, porcelain bronchial artery model. Uh, this is a well-established model for human, uh, you know, uh, several vascular system, right? You can see, this is the GPS, uh, the 3D, uh, you know, angiography, the geometry of the blood vessel. Based on that, we do calculation uh, to calculate the critical location uh, to place the magnet. And this beeping sound you hear uh, is the hard beeping uh, of this uh, pig model, right? Uh, so you can see uh, the neurosurgeon, once it's reached a critical uh, location, the neurosurgeon not only need to press the button, but uh, then this uh, 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 robot move to the desired pre-calculated positions to do the navigation. Uh, then they look at this block. Uh, once this guy will reach another uh, location, they push another button. Uh, so navigate this uh, So that's the potential you can achieve. Uh, really greatly leaving the common burden of the and you also also work in another room. How do you have the That's that. Now, uh, let me tell you even another vision, right? You can see uh, this is the soft uh, robotics plus AI plus 5G. If you want to really operate in another city, uh, we believe this will give us future precision medicine, right? This is really personalized, right? Uh, according to different person, the blood vessel. You can pre-plan, then you can control the robot to have a customized treatment strategy, right? And also, all stakeholders are on board, right? Scientists, uh, we are actually fully on board. Uh, we are doing science for curiosity, also for societal impact. You know, this equation, uh, with this model and equation, now we can even control uh, this, uh, you know, neurosurgical robot 
Uh, we really want to make this societal impact. Uh, surgeons, they are fully on board because they know they cannot be replaced. And this robot by no means can replace neurosurgeon, but it can remotely empower neurosurgeon. They can save more lives, safer, faster, remotely, with much less training time. Patient, time loss equal to brain loss. All stakeholders are on board. And the technology is converging towards this direction. I believe the policy and the society is also converging towards this direction. So I have full confidence uh, in accomplishing this uh, vision eventually. Yeah. So uh, then let me conclude that this part, this another fundamental challenge in science, technology, and the society. Right? Uh, so currently you have uh, you know, great progress in terms of genetic editing of cells on molecular level. Right? CRISPR is one of those examples. Right? Uh, then uh, can we robotically, uh, minimal invasively edit full body on a cellular level. Uh, we believe this can be uh, you know, equally important. Remove a tumor from anywhere of the body, minimal invasively. Deliver a specific drug or cell to a specific location on the body, minimal invasively. Right? Can we achieve this vision? Right? Uh, now, this in the piping system, basically blood vessels, uh, we believe there is a hope and we are exploring it. Uh, because uh, this is the dimension of the robot, right? You can really shrink it down to the order of 10 micrometer, right? So with this, you can go to, you know, most of the blood vessels, navigate throughout the full body of the blood vessels, right? So uh, we think really intravascularly, we have a hope to treat, to edit full body on a cellular level, right? So that's our hope, we, uh, you know, working uh, hard uh, towards this uh, vision. Uh, let me uh, conclude, right? So I discuss uh, soft materials innovation uh, and the potential impact on global health. Uh, especially I propose this uh, vision, uh, soft materials in couple with modern technology, AI, 5G, VR can make a huge impact on the society. Uh, by their health, right? There are lots of examples understanding and editing full body over the long term, right? days to months for imaging and editing the full body intravascularly, right? Uh, sustainable water, food, plastic, environment, energy. Uh, so this is another sector of research in my group. Uh, I don't have a chance to discuss this, uh, but uh, soft materials are really critical for sustainability, right? especially plastic. We all know, you know the, the, the pandemic, another pandemic plastic pandemic, right? So there is a huge impact of soft material uh, on this, uh, the future of uh, humans and society. And also I want to uh, emphasize on one point, uh, for impact, for societal impact, we will not stop at the papers. We publish paper to disseminate the knowledge. Uh, however, after publishing the paper, we work closely, uh, either in collaboration with established companies uh, to license our technology for societal impact or form of startup companies for societal impact. Uh, this is a one uh, example. Uh, this is CRRS, uh, license the technology of bonding elastomer and hydrogel together. So the, uh, the first part of my talk, uh, and then they apply this to this uh, realistic tissue phantom, a uh, hybrid uh, hydrogel elastomer system, and this is already the major medical phantoms in US. You know, many of the uh, doctors, you know, helping COVID patients are trained, were trained by this medical phantom. So that's the level of societal impact we can make. And here's another example. Uh, together with my student, uh, we co-founded Sana Hill. Uh, this is a, a company translating the bioadhesive technology. Uh, very interestingly, uh, the seed investors, in, uh, initial investors, are top surgeons from the country all over the US uh, because number one, uh, they are very rich, they're financially independent for sure. Uh, number two, uh, they know they need this uh, technology uh, in the surgery room. And we are in the uh, process of uh, translating, you know, the bioadhesive ultrasound. Uh, this uh, medical uh, soft robots technology, right? Uh, with the help of MIT Duce Foundation Center, particularly, right? Uh, okay, 
let me acknowledge uh, my collaborators. So research collaborators discussed in the talk, uh, Professor Gong Chen at MIT, Professor Alan Roch, uh, Professor Babi Padar, and the clinical collaborators, Professor Aman Patel, MGH, uh, Pablo Hawker, MGH, Iris Webbs, BIDMC, Rafael Bano, BWH, Franco Lozofo, MGH, uh, Christoph Nabzi, Mayo Clinic, Lehigh Griffiths, Mayo Clinic. Uh, of course, uh, you know, without uh, the support of a funding agency, we cannot do this work. Also, uh, greatly appreciate uh, the private donors uh, to our lab. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, wow, that was, uh, yeah, that was a lot of material we just covered. Um, thank you so much for going through all of that. Uh, just before, um, before Mia takes over to ask uh, questions, um, from our audience, I'm going to just sort of claim uh, claim the organizer's privilege, but it's just wondering if you could just very quickly uh, say a little bit more about um, sort of about the composition of some of these bioadhesives. Are they uh, new materials, biologically inspired, or? Um, yeah. yeah, thank you so much <laughs> for the question. It's a great question. So uh, you can see. Uh, when I discuss the bioadhesive tech, so the question is about the composition of the uh, bioadhesive, uh, you know, their safety, uh, their approval stage. So uh, let me uh, begin with uh, this, right? So you can see when I discuss this uh, bioadhesive technology, right, I didn't tell you a specific material because this is a mechanism based. This is really a platform. We can apply the mechanism uh, to different types of polymers, uh, adhesive polymers. So currently, uh, we harness uh, really the uh, uh, polymers and the biomaterials already being used in FDA approved products, right? So we combine those uh, polymers so that, you know, I'm FDA are familiar with those uh, polymers, even though we still need to go through the approval process, uh, but, uh, you know, this really lower the bar. And then we indeed uh, test them very rigorously uh, in rats models, uh, in pig models, so we test them. And we also compare their performance uh, uh, in comparison with existing commercially available FDA approved bioadhesives. And in terms of biocompatibility uh, and uh, there's a controllability, tunability of biodegradation, uh, you know, at least from our animal studies, this is even superior to existing FDA approved uh, bioadhesives. You can read those papers. Uh, we really have a side by side comparison. You know, at least on similar level, uh, some of them even uh, you know superior uh, to existing value here. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, number two a question is about the degradation, right? So that's an extremely important question, right? If you adhere tissue organs uh, uh, together, right? Once they heal, do you need to retrieve uh, them? Uh, it turns out because we can tune the material composition of this bioadhesive, we can really tune its uh, degradability. Uh, if you read those papers, you can see we can tune the degradation all the way from, let's say, uh, a week, two weeks, all the way to six months. And eventually, uh, they degrade. Uh, they will be absorbed by the body. Uh, by the way, we have not uh, tested this in human yet. Uh, Sana Hill actually is uh, working very hard. You know, the uh, student, the lead student of this project, now is the CTO of Sana Hill, uh, is in the pipeline of, uh, you know, uh, interacting with FDA, uh, get clinical trials ongoing. So we are working towards that. But we did a large animal tests, uh, if, for example, porcelain uh, models. Yeah, um, I think, wow, <laughs> I think we've gotten through, I think, you've already, I think you've already covered most of the um, questions that have come in, but um, I know you said you haven't done any uh, human um, trials, but we're wondering if, if you anticipate any, if, any effect on uh, people near someone who might be wearing um, a bioadhesive or uh, for say a continuous ultrasound. Oh, so that's uh, another question, a great question, right? Any side effect on people, uh, you know, uh, so the question is, 
any side effect of this uh, wearable ultrasound imaging, right? Uh, so yeah. first of all, the power of our ultrasound uh, is very low. I told you 10 milliwatts. Uh, so even uh, 10 times lower than Apple Watch, right? So that's uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, this is uh, a continuous imaging. Uh, we don't need to image it every second. Uh, we really image them, uh, you know, every 15 minutes, right? For some cases, for example, we are, have a project observing breast cancer development. Uh, it, for that case, you need only image, uh, let's say, once per day. Uh, so with that, uh, we do not anticipate uh, any side effect, uh, you know, on people. And also, this uh, has been approved. Uh, by the, you know, uh, by the, by, so basically uh, has been approved uh, for, uh, you know, human tests. So that power is much lower uh, than the current uh, clinical ultrasound imaging. So we don't anticipate any uh, side effect so far. Uh, there is a question about the uh, neuromuscular intervention uh, system. How far are the robotic system for neuromuscular interventions from commercialization? Uh, that's a great question. Actually, a reporter just asked me this question uh, today. Uh, we are in the process of uh, forming a startup company uh, with the help of MIT Dush Foundation Center. Uh, so I believe we'll form a company this year. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just by uh, just rough evaluation, uh, it will take us uh, two to three years uh, for clinical trials, for, uh, you know, potentially getting approvals, and then maybe uh, three to five years. Uh, for uh, true commercialization. And this is just my uh, rough evaluation, right? Uh, it may be longer, maybe shorter, really depends on the progress of the translation of the startup company. Right? But uh, you know, uh, the approval of this uh, rob robotic system, uh, the bar may be even lower in comparison with the uh, uh, bioadhesive. The reason is this robot uh, will not uh, you know, uh, uh, stay in the body for long term. It's really temporary. You know, you do all the operation, you withdraw everything. So that with that, we have you know this uh, confidence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay, yeah. I can ask uh, this. Uh, I can you know just uh, uh, you know, uh, repeat this question. So Jerry asked a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, a company named Steer Texas uh, has commercialized a uh, magnetic catheter navigation system uh, that is being used for navigation in heart and the brain. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, the question is, uh, if I'm uh, familiar with this system, can I comment on this system? Uh, so, uh, Jerry, great. So we actually uh, even uh, test our robot uh, with uh, steroid Texas. Uh, steroid Texas is, is only for heart, not for brain. Uh, I can tell you the reason. So uh, steroid Texas, uh, uh, they are robot. Uh, they are really coupling rigid magnets uh, to a, a you know, micro cat. And that's mainly for uh, cardiovascular navigation. The catheter is much thicker uh, than the uh, you know uh, soft robot I showed uh, to the uh, audience today. So that's uh, number one is for uh, uh, cardiovascular. Uh, number two, their magnetic system controlling system is huge. It's really surround the full body. Uh, then uh, you cannot couple that with uh, the CRM fluoroscopy uh, for neural intervention. So there is not enough space uh, for you to work with. Our system is really a small, you know, robotic arm holding this standard, really give the flexibility to target the new. Uh, number three, uh, actually before us, uh, indeed that there are companies, I'm not sure it's still Texas, but there are other companies uh, trying to uh, develop this, uh, you know, a, a small magnet coupled with a very thin guidewire to navigate in the brain. Uh, the magnet by itself is not uh, robust enough it may detach, so that's number one. Number two, uh, this system is not as uh, flexible as our system. Uh, probably I can show the audience a video. So I, I got this uh, question a lot. Uh, let me quickly show a very quick video uh, to show the uh, difference. Let me see. Uh, uh, so this is when you try to use a magnet. Uh, to navigate inside uh, the, the this mouth blood vessel, right? Uh, so uh, you can see how rigid uh, this is. Uh, so very challenging, and this uh, may even detach. So you do not have such a flexibility and the capability of uh, uh, navigation, really. So for, for example, here, right? 
Uh, then this is our system. Right? Uh, you can see the clear difference. Uh, this uh, full body is soft and it's extremely robust. This is based on polyurethane, very, very robust material. So really, so this is the uh, difference between the robots. And then secondly, uh, the controlling system, magnetic controlling system are very different, yeah. Uh, but a great question. So uh, it's a really expert in our audience, right? That's uh, really uh, MIT alums. Uh, so that's that. Uh, and then, yeah. Uh, yeah, let me see. Oh. Uh, yes, because we're getting a, we're a little we're past uh yeah past eight o'clock now, but um sure. I yeah, think so I, I, we, uh, I was gonna say just the other um yeah, I have a one more question and just a, a, a comment for me. I think uh um I think it's it's fantastic the idea of of um less time to to the the faster learning curve for the neurosurgeons to be able to use yeah. this tool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I still, I still hope uh, I never have to work with a neurosurgeon who's had, <laughs> who hasn't had years of extensive training. Um, and uh, just, we've been talking about um, how close the soft robots are for surgical um, getting into the, the clinics, but um, when do you think we might start seeing uh, bioadhesives in first aid kits or? Uh, that's a good question, Evelyn. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, one major uh, application of uh, asana here uh, is for first aid, uh, for you know trauma, natural disaster, uh, for stop bleeding. Because currently many people are on uh, blood thinner, right? Then if you use uh, you know coagulation based hemostasis, uh, it's too slow. Sometimes you cannot even uh, cannot stop the bleeding. Uh, with our technology, right? Uh, you literally adhere the wound together. So for you know, emergency, trauma, natural disaster, military kids, uh, that's uh, indeed one major application of our bioadhesive technology. Uh, now it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, really led by Samaq, uh, the startup company. Uh, well, I guess, um, I say we are at uh, five minutes past the hour. So, um, so I'd just like to say thank you very much, uh, Professor Zhao, we look forward to, uh, yeah, to seeing how how fast these um, yeah when we can see uh, bioadhesive products at our local uh, drugstore. But um, yes, thank every thank you everyone for attending, and don't forget to check out the uh, the MIT Club of Boston uh, homepage for more of our upcoming events. And uh, once again, thank you, Professor Zhao. Yeah, great pleasure. See you. Bye.